Hey everyone, thanks for joining me at History Summit 2020 and a big shout out to the organizer today, Lindsay Chervinsky, for curating such an amazing conversation. There's a lot of really great talks online and I'm thankful to have been included. I'm getting ready to launch a new book. It's called Alaric the Goth, An Outsider's History of the Fall of Rome, and it'll be out in June from W.W. Norton. It's about an immigrant who grew up on the border of the Roman Empire and in 410 AD plotted the worst attack on the city of Rome in its thousand year existence an event that maybe even led to the fall of the Western Empire. You'll be able to see the official book trailer for that at the end of my talk, and I'm pretty excited about how it turned out. But if you don't know anything about Alaric yet, that's why I'm here. Some of you might be newcomers to ancient history, or maybe you've had prior experience with books about Rome or Greece with heavy focus on traditional topics like battles or generals or the lives of great men. I'm always someone who's looking for an un unconventional take on a story. So what I thought would be cool for me to do would be to talk about a few other books from other periods that inspired my research. For historians, any topic poses its own unique challenges and opportunities. It could be the hunt for information for a biography of an important person, or it could be the dead end search that comes about for looking for a life that has seemingly vanished into thin air. And Alaric is certainly someone who fits into that latter category. But there were a lot of great models for me out there, specifically not about antiquity, which gave me insight into how to go about tracking down his story. And I figured it would be fun to talk about them. Plus, I happen to have them all here on my shelf at home, which made this pretty easy. So in chronological order from earliest to most recent, here they are, starting with number one, Ross King's 2000 book, Brunelleschi's Dome about Florence and the engineering of the city's iconic cathedral. This book takes a topic that's really big and a period that can be hard to wrap your head around, the Renaissance, and it brings it all down to an individual human level, which was absolutely a crucial model for me as I thought about telling the story of the end of the Roman Empire. If you've never been to Italy, or if you have, and you want to experience a little bit more deeply what it's like to climb the Duomo and look out from the top, uh, because you were probably too terrified of heights to enjoy it when you were there, like me. Ross King's book is great. What really impressed me, though, is how much historical information it delivers through the life of a single person. Pippo, as they called Filippo Bernaleschi back then, grew up a few decades after the Black Death had come to Europe. And in addition to getting all sorts of eye-on-the-ground details, like what you could do in the city if you had, say, 200 um, florins, you get these great vignettes about life during the plague, my favorite being how the Florentines used to ring the church bells because they thought it would drive the disease away. I really admired this approach because I think a lot of times wider audiences can be hesitant to really dive into specialized books, but a good biography can help lure people into something just as complex, which I think is important for our historians if you want to show folks how scholarship might be changing from what they knew before or what they had been taught elsewhere. The second book is one that I absolutely adore because A, it's so well written, and B, it really captures this momentum we're seeing about um, wanting to be more inclusive in the stories that we tell. It's Jill Lepore's 2012 book called Book of Ages, The Life and Opinions of Jane Franklin, Benjamin Franklin's sister. I think everyone recognizes Ben, but his sister is that person that few people would probably readily know anything about. And for me, this book was really a masterclass in how to tell the life of a person who might otherwise be invisible in the documents or the sources. I know I had to think really creatively at times about where to even look for the scraps of information that could help document Alaric's life. And there were definitely a lot of things on first glance that I never expected to furnish me any kind of pertinent material, like the butchered rabbit bones that archaeologists dug up in Romania from a Gothic settlement. But Lepore's book did a really good job of showing how a little extra effort often goes a long way in these types of endeavors. As Jane's brother famously said, one half of the world doesn't know how the other half lives, but all that doesn't mean history has to stay that way. And that leads up to my last book, a really fun read about Paris in the 17th century called City of Lights, City of Poison by Holly Tucker. This one came out in 2017, and I remember when I saw the news about it, it was one of those books that I knew immediately I needed to get and start reading. It was about this really iconic place, Versailles and Paris in the time of Louis XIV, and about how a spate of poisonings gripped the city during the tenure of the first police chief there. 
above all, it reminded me of a good detective story, but it was one of those books that really take the time to rewind what you think you know and tell you how it all came together from many different perspectives, from the people at the top of the ladder, like the kings and the queens, to the folks at the bottom who are often overlooked, like the widows and valets and governesses who played a role in the history too. That was certainly a priority for me that I shared uh, in writing a book about the end of the Roman Empire, which is usually told as a sequence of emperors and battles and invasions. But Alaric's people um, played an important role in that, even though they've often been presented in narratives as wild savages or barbarians. And I felt it was pretty well past time to move them out of the shadows and the margins of the history books and give them their own voice, not just whip up some quick caricature of them like the Romans often did. So I hope these books give you a little flavor of the kinds of history that I like reading. And, um, and maybe as for the challenges of bringing out a work like this, if you're a historian considering writing for a wider audience, just remember that you're not going to have all the space that you need to give an exhaustive treatment of every heated scholarly debate. Narrative is going to really drive a lot of the choices that you make. And it's always going to be hard for a specialist in one area of history to break out of all the noise and find a way to interest people in, in other audiences. But these three books succeeded, I think, because they're great stories. They're good biographies of lost lives and views of history from the ground up. And those are the parts of Alaric's life that really appealed to me and challenged me as I wrote it. And I just hope that I did him right. So stay tuned for the book trailer, which is going to follow the credits here. You can also find it and share it on YouTube. And I'd really appreciate it if you pre-order Alaric the Goth through the link at History Summit or wherever it is you're ordering your books right now. Thanks for watching, y'all. I'm excited to hear your questions on Twitter today, and be safe. There are two sides to every story. There's the one that everybody knows, and there's the one that's harder to find. I'm the kind of person who likes tracking down lost versions of events. My name is Douglas Boyne. I'm a professor of history, and I'm the author of the biography Alaric the Goth, An Outsider's History of the Fall of Rome. It's the first history book in English to tell the story of the end of the Roman Empire through the life of the Goth who attacked it. On August 24th of the year 410, Alaric and the Goths masterminded a sneak attack on the city of Rome, the cultural capital of an empire that at the time crossed three continents, hosted numerous languages, and was called home by 60 million people. For three days, Alaric set fire to the city, kidnapped innocent citizens, and shocked the city's residents, leaving the government stunned. Romans attributed this unfortunate moment to Alaric's identity as a barbarian, but I wanted to understand the way he viewed the world, not the way others viewed him. That's why I wrote this book. And what I found in putting together the pieces of his life is an overlooked chapter in the history of citizenship. It's about how the Roman Empire treated its foreigners and its immigrants, and what happened in a time of political paralysis that gave rise to such a catastrophic outcome. What I hope people walk away with when they're done with this book is that they have a better appreciation for how one person can change the path of history, even when they die a failure, like Alaric did. And in the process, I also hope that people see that learning the story of an outsider's life can make us better informed citizens, too.